Hello, everyone. My name is Mariana Ramirez, and I organize the exhibition upstairs, Latoya Ruby Frazier, Flint is Family. And I would like to welcome you all today to the Frost Art Museum. Thank you all so much for coming. Before we jump in, I would like to make a few announcements. First, um, if you had a chance to look at some of the images uh, on the screen by Terrence Price II, one of our panelists, his solo exhibition, Dancing in the Absence of Pain, is now on view at Art Center, South Florida. And I highly encourage everyone to go visit this very thoughtful exhibit. Um, in addition, if you are after this panel, like really wanting more information on Flint water crisis, we have two books for sale at the front desk, um, both of which were very helpful in researching um, this exhibition. I would also like to thank the members of the Frost Art Museum for making today's panel um, possible. If you're not a member, I would highly encourage you to become one. We have student memberships for $20 and FIU staff memberships for $35. And you can also see Tanya if you are interested in becoming a member. Now, um, having grown up in Michigan, a few hours from Flint, I watched, as many of you did, as the headlines broke about Flint's contaminated water and the city and state's willful negligence to, the, to its citizens. While researching this exhibition, I learned that the issues went much deeper and a perfect storms of systemic problems collided. Just so that we're all on the same page, I'm going to give you a quick synopsis of the Flint water crisis. In April 2014, the city of Flint, Michigan, under the supervision of an emergency manager, switched its water source in order to save money. The city was millions of dollars in debt, and instead of receiving water treated in Detroit, they decided to source the water from the Flint River and treat it at their local water treatment facility. Immediately, residents complained that the water was brown, that it smelled, and that it gave them rashes. Four months after the water switched, General Motors announced that they would get their water from another source because the Flint water was corroding their engines. It would take another year and a half, however, before they switched, the city switched the water back. During that time, 12 people died of Legionnaire's disease, a bacteria spread through water, and thousands of adults and children were exposed to high levels of lead. Now, one of my passions uh, with looking at art is looking at how it incorporates with other disciplines. And I think the exhibition, Flint is Family, exemplifies how art can create a human connection with issues of science and public policy, health, and current events. And I am so pleased that we're able to bring a panel today together to discuss some of these issues. We will leave some time at the end of the panel for questions, so if you can hold off until then. Now, when putting together this panel, I knew immediately that I wanted Dean Tomas Guiarte as our moderator. Dean Guiarte spoke uh, at our mixtape event back in September, and I knew that not only did his research into lead poisoning align with today's panel, but also he is an artist in his spare time. I would say more, but I'm actually going to play a video that better illustrates Dean Guiarte's research. We've all heard about the crisis in Flint, Michigan. What people don't realize, this is a major public health issue throughout our entire country. At least four million households in the United States have children who are being exposed to high levels of lead. This can lead to low IQ, schizophrenia, and many other significant brain disorders. This is catastrophic to children, their families, and our communities. And until recently, it was believed this brain damage was irreversible. With the research we're doing here at FIU, we're very close to developing treatments for these children and adolescents to give them a new lease on life. And incredibly, we're expecting the treatment to cost only pennies. Working at Dr. Gilorte's lab at FIU has been the best experience of my life. I was very fortunate to receive a scholarship for FIU's Temple College of Public Health and Social Work. Now I get to do the most challenging and rewarding work that has the power to change the lives of so many people. It is so crucial that these projects continue to receive funding, and I know that FIU is dedicated to the cause. So, this isn't just a life-changing opportunity for our community, but a real cost-effective solution for the entire world. Am I on? Yes? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be here today and to be uh, Dean of the Robert Stemble College of, Social, of Public Health and Social Work. This is a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, I started 
studying the effect of lead exposure on the brain over 25 years ago. And I don't have a lot of time to tell you right now, but uh, we're very close to a solution, as, as I indicated um, in, in the uh, video, that can only cost pennies. What, what we have to realize is that flint is the tip of the iceberg. Uh, the amount of, the number of children in the United States and globally that are being exposed to lead on a daily basis is in the millions. So this is a, a public health problem of really global proportions. And until recently, there's not a lot that we could do uh, to take care of it. Obviously, prevention is, is the first tenet of public health, but lead is so embedded in our environments throughout the world that is almost impossible to um, prevent children and adults uh, from being exposed to lead. So I'll, I'll stop there and I'd like to um, tell the panel to please uh, introduce themselves. Maybe we can start uh, with Mr. Pritt. Hello, oh, sorry. Uh, my name is Terrence Price. I'm a photographer, born and raised here in South Florida and I document the human condition in a lot of predominantly, predominantly black neighborhoods here in South Florida. And I'm currently a resident artist at Art Center, so on the beach. I'm Consuelo Bexague. I'm a pediatrician. I have not done formal research in lead because most of my work has been on infectious diseases. Um, but I would, I would like to say, that I treated a lot of children, I mean, actually during the 70s and 80s, when I was a practicing pediatrician, the, there was a tremendous part of the bread and butter of pediatrics was treating lead um, in children, uh, which is a horribly grisly experience. Mm -hmm. And since I came to Miami and joined uh, and Dr. Guilarte, join the faculty, um, I have found that uh, what that lead is, is alive, <laughs> alive and well. Um, and it is, in fact, not just alive and well in, in Flint, it's alive and well here, too. Good afternoon, I'm Valerie Patterson. I'm in the, fac um, the faculty of the um, Public Policy and Administration Program here at FIU, uh, I teach uh, in the area of uh, public management. I teach in the context course. I also teach the capstone course. Uh, I am the co-chair of the specialization that focuses on human resource management and policy. I'm affiliated faculty in African and African diasporic studies. Uh, I also am affiliated faculty with women and gender studies. I'm very interested in, um, in my most recent research focuses on post-racial performance of race, gender, and policing in majority minority communities. My most recent, um, I served as a, as a guest editor of a symposium, and I just wanted to um, give you the introduction, the title of the symposium and the theme. It was called Government at the Margins, Locating, Deconstructing Ways of Performing Government in the Age of Excessive Force, hypersurveillance, civil disobedience, and political self-interest. Lessons learned in a post-racial America. I was very excited to serve as the editor of this symposium because this is an area that touches me deeply and an area that I'm very interested in. Thank you. I guess this is on. So uh, my name is Piero Gardinali. I'm, I'm a chemist, so simple chemist you may say. Uh, I'm a professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. I do analytical chemistry as, as my you know, uh, trade, and uh, I'm also an associate director in our Institute of Water and the Environment. So um, I guess my job is to see what's in the water. And uh, you know, sometimes I don't like the answer that I get. <laughs> so part of my job is just to chase why and then try to you know, create a solution that we can drink you know, good water for, you know, a number of years and not having to drink the water that we shouldn't be drinking at, at all the time. So 
uh, hopefully I'll be able to answer any questions about chemistry in the water and, and specifically with metals. And uh, again, I thank the opportunity for, for being able to do this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So b before I start with question for to the panelists, I'd like to make a couple of comments. And one of them is that, that lead and many other environmental toxins don't discriminate. Mm -hmm. uh, however, if you look at the statistics, the majority of children mm -hmm. in the United States and globally that are exposed to lead, well, certainly in the United States, African American and Hispanics. Mm -hmm. The great proportion of the children uh, fall in this category is typically they live in low uh, economic uh, housing uh, in many of the major cities uh, throughout the United States. Uh, in the situation of Flint, Michigan, 57% of the population is African American. And as you can see in, in, in the videos uh, from uh, the Flint water, this is extremely corrosive water. I mean, if, if it's corroding the parts of a car, just think about what it'll do to a human being. Uh, so, so this is uh, a, a, a problem that is not just in water. It's in, in pain in many homes. There are millions of homes in the United States that people still live in today that are lead contaminated. Mm -hmm. It is in the soil from the many years and decades of burning uh, leaded gasoline. It is in many products that come from abroad, from areas of Central America, South America, and from uh, Asia. So I don't want you to get the idea that it's just in water. It's literally everywhere. And so it's a very, very significant issue. So I'd like to start the first question to uh, Mr. Price. Uh, so in the exhibition, Flint is Family by Latoya Ruby Fraser, mm -hmm. spent five months in Flint documenting one family and their community as they were experiencing a water crisis. So in your experiences, in your work, right. you document your Miami Gardens community. Why do you think it's important for someone to document a community they belong to or spend considerable time with? Um, I think it's important because uh, I feel like photography, especially the type of work that I do on my community, it's coming from the source. So it's coming from this particular neighborhood and it's not being portrayed by somebody else's, else's gaze coming into the neighborhood and only finding what you know, they take from it to explain to other people. So I believe that my work kind of, not kind of, but I believe that my work expresses what is coming out of this neighborhood rather than somebody else's eyes. So what, what, are you, what do you think are some of the misconceptions um, that outsiders have uh, in, in regards to Miami Gardens? Well, a lot of the time they think that it's a, a bad neighborhood uh, especially the way it's portrayed in the news and I think my pictures kind of breaks that down to show you that these are people and they are living in this area <clears throat> so Dr. Gardinelli question for you lead pipes are found in most communities throughout the United States could you give us an idea why lead entered the water in Flint, Michigan? What, what happened in this particular situation? Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start back with a, a Spanish answer to that. OK. And uh, <laughs> that's, that's a good approach here in Miami. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> lead, lead is, is one of the oldest metals that humans managed to kind of domesticate, if you want to call it something. Uh, in Spanish, it's called plomo. It comes from the ancient Romans of plumum. So it was related to plumbing mm -hmm. since the first days that we needed to move water around. Mm -hmm. uh, it's easy to find. You put it in the fire, you can get pure lead. You can you know, mold it. You can make a pipe and all that. So in the early days, it was about the only material that we have to transport water from place A to place B. Uh, Lead, yeah, it's toxic if you, if you consume it, but it gets oxidized very quickly if we put it in the environment. So, um, you know, if you get a, a, a nail and you put it out there, it rusts very quickly, but it then it crumbles. And, you know, lead doesn't do that. Lead just creates, you know, an oxide coating on it, and it protects it, unless you mess up with the water that goes in. 
So uh, if you have an old house with lead pipes, there's nothing wrong with it as long as the water that went through those pipes was very constant with very nice uh, conditions for that lead piping. The moment you change the pH of the water, the oxygen in the water, or you, 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 you skim on the antioxidants or corrosive uh, you know, inhibition materials, then you change the chemistry of the water. And then when you send it into the homes, everything that accumulated in that lead pipe you know, for years, it gets dissolved very quickly, and then it's immediately put into your, your glass of water. So I think that's one of the biggest problems that they have in Flint, uh, that you know, they change the, uh, the characteristics of the water to the point that they started dissolving uh, lead from the pipes very quickly. And uh, I think that's one of the biggest problems that they had. So, so, so just uh, as, as you spoke, it reminds me that uh, this situation also happened in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. many, maybe 20 years prior to Flint. Mm -hmm. I wonder why is it that our public officials don't learn from previous experiences in, previ in other cities about what could happen. And I'm, Dr. Patterson, I'm going to follow up a question about policy with you. Uh, because this was exactly what happened in Washington, D.C. approximately uh, 18, 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, so it's always nice to dream on a lead-free society. Hopefully we'll get there at some point in time. But uh, the regulation is that you, you mainly test the water that you, you provide out of a, wa a water treatment plant, but you are not required to monitor the water inside somebody's home. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in really old cities, you know that the piping is old. Uh, but then in some cities that have been changing with, with time, you know, you have a combination of old pipes, new pipes, and all that, so things become different. So uh, I could see somebody saying, well, we're not going to have such a big problem if we do this change in the chemistry. But then they haven't, do this, they, they haven't done the studies to figure out, you know, really what's going to change and how many people are we, we going to affect. So. Um, Sadly, it's up to the owner of the property to test the water that comes out of their pipes. And um, hopefully we can do a lot more to give access to people that live in homes that are old and may have these pipes uh, to get free access to you know, analysis and stuff like that. But uh, we're not there yet. But, uh, so. Dr. Patterson, prior to and during the, the water crisis, mm -hmm. the city of Flint was under the supervision of an emer emergency manager. Mm -hmm. Um, could you briefly explain what an emergency manager is and maybe discuss how um, such an individual uh, affects the communities of color? Right, right. So, um, the you know, states uh, taking over the local authority in a crisis is nothing new. It's happened in uh, cities across the country. There have been emergency financial man managers in Philadelphia, Washington. Uh, DC and most famously New York City during the 70s. Um, the thing about the Flint emergency manager, so, so the emergency manager is a person who is um, appointed, in the Flint case, it, the, the emergency manager was appointed by the governor, governor, right? And this person is authorized to act for and in place of the local governing body. body and the administrative officer of the community. So, so the, the, the issue then becomes, and Michigan was, was very interesting in the sense that the, the law, there are three laws uh, over time. Um, and the second law, I think it was 92, uh, Public Act 92, the, the um, powers that were given to the um, emergency manager, the, 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 the citizens of, of Michigan actually uh, passed a referendum to repeal that law because it was too aggressive. So Michigan has been very aggressive in terms of the, you know, the taking over of uh, financially distressed cities, right? And, 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 and Michigan actually sees um, the state as having, as, as being the sovereign and not, um, and, and, this, and the city is actually being an appendage of the state, but the, the state holds the ultimate power. And so in these financially distressed, uh, fiscally distressed cities in Michigan, then you know, the governor appoints this emer emergency manager to take control of the city 
and make it more financially stable and sound. And and um, and I was I was told to be brief, so <laughs> I'm not gonna like give you sort of the, the 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 skills and attributes. But but the emergency manager was reporting to Treasury, right? And 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 the people in the communities that were managed by the emergency manager have no control or no say whatsoever in what happens with the city, which is, you know, problematic. And and thus um um and and in Michigan the cities that were under the control of emergency managers were predominantly black cities. Ultimately, the problem is, again, th this notion of democracy and, and, um, and removing the control of the city from the citizens of the city and putting it into the hands of this external individual who has the power to make decisions. Thank you. So just another little bit of a statistics, you know, again, we, we, we have all the news and, and, uh, about Flint, and, but what is really sad is that in a city next to it, in Detroit, 25 to 30 percent of all the school children need special education mm. as a result of lead intoxication. So I have a map, I, which I should have brought, of the, the city of Detroit with dots that with different colors, and each color represents the blood lead level. And the city is completely filled with that. So I just want to give you an idea that this, this uh, event, horrific event that uh, took place in Flint is taking place every day in many cities throughout the United States. They just don't get the attention that it should. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Saget, we obviously know about the children, uh, but adults were also exposed to lead. Uh, could you tell us uh, why, what is the difference in, in the uh, toxicity of an adult versus a child, and what makes a child more susceptible uh, to lead in your toxicity? That's a great question. I'm going to start the answer by kind of piggybacking on the point that you made that lead does not discriminate. Um, I would like the corollary for that is that um, racism does discriminate. Poverty is very discriminatory. Mm -hmm. And so the distribution you see, actually, lead exposure is much more ubiquitous than actual poor outcomes. Why? Believe it or not, many, many people um, who are adults, elderly people right now, played by making lead soldiers um, and had a, a potential big exposure why didn't those people get the kind of damage that children, as, as children that our children in our communities get? And part of it is part of the, uh, does anyone, has anybody heard the, the word WIC, WIC, W-I-C? Okay, WIC is a government program from the 60s, started in the, 60s, started in the 70s, and kind of grew up uh, with, at the same time that I was growing up with medicine. In medicine, um, one of the big WIC uh, pushes was to promote um, giving milk and meat products and vitamin D products, uh, vitamin C products to children at risk of lead. Why? That's the reason why wealthier children get exposed to lead, play with lead, and don't absorb it. That interrupts the absorption. But even after the absorption, and as a person, is the central nervous system is developing um, in the mother's womb and then after when they're uh, little kids, the, the brain is developing in a way that's extremely um, rapid and extremely sensitive. But you have those exposures for that exposure to actually turn into what we think of as lead intoxication. First, the person has to absorb it. And we look at the, <coughs> the inequalities of diet and environment, but there's another uh, inequality yet. And this is part of Dr. Gilarte's research, 
which kind of opened my eyes because in the bad times, in the horrible times of the 70s and 80s, all that we could do for children was calcium EDTA injections, which are horrifically painful. They're agonizing. And the, the mothers would bring the children thinking this was going to fix things. And all it was going to do is to reduce the lead level in the child, but we didn't think that there was anything that could bring back their, their child's um, cognitive abilities. Now we know, thanks to Dr. Gilarte's research, that not only do um, great diet and great environments reduce um, exposure and uptake, but it also helps the brain heal after that damage. And the, the thing for pennies is not the environment. I mean, that's not pennies. That's expensive. And again, uh, poverty the, does discriminate. But the other treatment that he's talking about is actually a chemical reversal of the process, which I hope he's going to say a little bit more about, because the movie just makes magic. Um, there's, there's more to it um, than that. But in, in, in general, anything that has to do with brain damage tends to be more of a problem for the, for the child in the womb, for the infant, and for the, the child. The reason why we think of it mostly as preschool children is that actually getting around the house and getting exposed to the, to the uh, paint, which was a big problem back in my days, and to the dirt, that was more when the child could walk. I'm sorry to have made such a long answer. No, but I'm going to follow on your comments uh, because it, it reminds me of how I actually got interested in this. It was in the 80s. I was uh, um, at the uh, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, which sits in the middle of an African-American community, very poor community, where many of the homes were lead intoxicated. And I remember seeing kids coming to the Kennedy Krieger Institute, which was the, the place at Hopkins where uh, children would come to get treated for chelation therapy at the time, calcium EDTA. And uh, these were highly contaminated uh, communities, and the children offered, oftentimes were known by a number, and that number was their bloodlets. What is sad is that today, many of those homes are still there, and many of the kids continue to live, despite the city knowing that this is happening. And it happens in New York City, it happens in Detroit, it ha happens in many, many communities throughout the United States. So anyway, going back to Mr. Uh, Price, um, so you mentioned in previous interviews that you had that your photographs are capturing history. Right. And that you're interested in archiving that history. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit more about uh, history and the need to document? And also, who are some of the artists that uh, you're interested in, in documenting in your experiences? Um, I feel like uh, the need to document communities of color is because um, usually, you know, just like in Flint, they're the communities that are suffering the most from these changes. And like Dr. Patterson said, that these out, outer companies will come into the community and make changes, and then you have to think about who's going to suffer from these changes. So in the communities of color, you have people that are able to document the time, so that way those pictures and those documents are also like a way to show that we're here and also a way to protest against change. And um, a lot of photographers like Gordon Parks, uh, even Latoya Ruby Frazier, who um, one of her older series, she documented herself in uh, Braddock, Pennsylvania. And her, I believe her series is called The Notion of Family. Mm -hmm. And she documents uh, her herself and her family in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and these small black communities that are living amongst these, uh, these major industrial companies that are like taking up the majority of the land and building up Pittsburgh. But you tend to forget about these small communities. So that's why I think that it's important to document, and especially the way that Latoya Ruby Frazier documented Flint. Had she not documented those photos, you would only see what media is putting out rather than this family that's living 
and still, you know, able to find happiness, but they're still living with these issues of not being able to have clean water. And that sounds ridiculous. So, you, so you're giving a, a more personal touch to these this, uh, yes. horrific cases that continue to take place here in the United States. Right. And Dr. Gardinali, so I, I wanna go, you, you are the water expert here, so I wanna, I wanna ask you a question, um, just a broad question, not just about lead, but how, how widespread are the issue of contamination in water? Uh, whether it be lead or other contaminants that you're familiar with, since it's one of your areas of research? Um, well, I, I would like to say that the answer is hopefully not that widespread. Um, but that's, that's, sadly, that's not the answer. Um, and one thing that we're always taught is if you want to know the quality of your water, just go and check the report on your <coughs> utilities, right? So we used to have a book. And now you can get them online and, you know, you look at it and you, there's a whole bunch of numbers like, you know, one home out of 562 fails something and all that. But that's what's measures, right? You know, inside my home, I don't have that answer. So um, I, I talked about the lead pipes before, you know, maybe I, re I, I renovated my home, I changed all the pipes, but still the pipe that goes from the meter to my home, uh, I didn't bother digging it out, is that right? Or, or, um, so, I don't know what the answer to that question is because I don't think we measure the water at every point that we need to measure it. So, uh, is it widespread? It could be. You know, lead is one of those things. Um, you have copper pipes. Um, the, the EPA has something called the uh, lead copper rule. So the utilities have to uh, look at their water and figure out uh, how they have to treat it to not release enough copper or enough lead at the same time. So um, th there are safeguards there, but you know, um, between the things that we know and the things that we don't know. <laughs> uh, so lead is really well known, uh, but you know, every time we dispose of pharmaceuticals mm -hmm. and other stuff, you know, so, um, and, and again, our standards of treatment are often massage by, by economic conditions. So um, there's a number of things that go to that answer. So again, I would like to hope that uh, drinking water in, in the US is, is up to a really good standard, uh, but then we see examples that, that it's not. So. So, so just to give you an idea, in, in the Flint case, uh, the EPA limit for lead in water is 15 parts per billion. In some homes in Flint, they detected lead levels of 13,000 parts per billion. So this was quite significant breach of EPA guidelines. And what I find is really even to me from a public health perspective is that some of these municipalities, the, the officials in some of these municipalities in Flint and in other places actually knew that they were above the EPA standards and they didn't report it but didn't do anything about it. So it's really a, a very sad story. Even when you think that you have safe water, mm -hmm. that, that may not be the case. Um, so uh, <clears throat> Dr. Patterson, in, in um, Flynn is clearly, as I indicated earlier, that uh, the higher lead levels were in poorer black neighborhoods, mm -hmm. uh, many which, of which had you know, uh, empty homes mm -hmm. uh, than in wealthier areas of the town. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was due to the fact that they, uh, in, in, in many of these vacated homes, the water sat in pipes because the pipes were not being used or you know, there was no uh, uh, usage of, 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 the, of the homes. And they collected more lead and some of the other uh, uh, um, factors that, that Dr. Gardinale mentioned. So could you tell us some of the policies and actions that lead to the development of these primarily uh, black neighborhoods in Flint? Right, so, um, so the, the Flint story is um, a very interesting story, a complex story. Uh, and, um, and again, the, ultimately, the, um, the, and, and duplicated in other parts of the country, but there's like uh, um, the movement uh, similar to, to my, the neighborhood that I, that I currently uh, live in in unincorporated North Dade. So the 
the, the movement from predominantly white you know, to predominantly black neighborhoods. But in the Flint case, it was the, the, um, the, um, the what, what was referred to as spatial uh, uh, racism and uh, uh, policies that were actually um, presented as race neutral, but th that were racist as well. So the whole notion of redlining is an example of how these predominantly um, black neighborhoods developed in, Front, in Flint. So going from um, um, the trying to post the Depression era uh, to the creation of uh, government housing uh, agencies and authorities, and, and then the creation of, of um, policies that were designed to um, develop um, and, and stir and uh, create the building of, of housing in neighborhoods to again to stimulate growth, but what happened in the in the Flint case was that they had um, different areas of Flint um, that townships and 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 where it, it moved from um, a very depressed uh, community to one where um, people you think about the GM. And, and, and then developing the infrastructure to, to support uh, a corporation of the size of GM. But then people desiring to, um, to move away and, and move into better housing and better neighborhoods and, um, and creating this urban sprawl. So, so what, what essentially happened is the people who were able to, to um, attain some sort of economic prosperity, the white people moved into these surrounding areas and the people in, in historically, uh, the, the black neighborhoods were, were redlined. So, so you know about redlining, um, the um, government surveyors who actually graded neighborhoods, color coding green for the best, blue for the most, blue for it's still desirable, but uh, uh, yellow, red, and then red for hazardous, and usually the, the, the hazardous uh, neighborhoods are the black neighborhoods, and they're, they're actually, um, those neighborhoods at, initially that were made up predominantly of African Americans, but even Catholics, Jews, and immigrants from Asia and Southern Europe were also made a, a part of those neighborhoods that, that um, were, were redlined. And the, the, you know, the literature sort of suggests that even today, you can still see the, the remnants of the redlining and the, the adverse impact that has occurred. Absolutely. Dr. Bexaga, I wonder whether you can tell us a little bit more about what options, and you sort of touched on this a little earlier, do these children in Flint, Michigan have or had to try to uh, treat them from, from their exposures? Well, I mean, that is, that's, a, uh, that's a part where I think there's considerable hope now that there wasn't back uh, 40 years ago, 45 years ago, when children would um, come to the emergency room having seizures and, and you knew, uh, you found that it was lead. And I was, I was always thinking, how can this be? How can this be? And why isn't this meningitis, which was a little bit more acceptable <laughs> in our day? How can this be that we're letting children, and you know, the ones that died were pretty much the lucky ones because the, the ones that were left devastated, there was nothing much that could be offered for them. It was a very hopeless situation. Now, I think there's something that can be done um, for those children, and the, the first step is that we have to, first of all, recognize that they're not all in Flint. They're all around us, mm -hmm. and that we have to stop thinking as a community that there are people uh, maintaining careful surveillance, staying up all night, um, checking 
uh, whether, whether the lead levels are uh, going in the wrong direction, um, that's not something that is happening. If we want some, some of that to happen, we need to actually demand those data and um, actually start the research uh, to, to see if we can do something for those children so that this experimentation that has been so impressive in animals, uh, in animal studies, um, can be actually turned into treatment for children in our communities. So just to give you an idea, just for the audience uh, uh, benefit, so back and still today, um, children um, chelation therapy would not be started unless a child had a blood lead levels of around 40 micrograms per deciliter. The, the level of um, concern uh, of the uh, CDC today is five. And actually, today we know that we can see effects below five micrograms per deciliter. So the point that I wanted to make is that if a child had a blood lead of 10 or 15 or 20 or 25 or 30, Nothing was done. They would just advise the parents and educate the parents of how to best clean the home uh, so that you can prevent the exposure, but there was absolutely no treatment. It was only when you got to about 40 micrograms per deciliter blood lead that they would initiate this chelation therapy that Dr. Beck Saget uh, indicated. So, um, I, you know, th there's a lot more that, that can be done, and, and we'll be talking a little bit about that. So, um, Mr. Price, with you again. <laughs> uh, if your art is documenting your neighborhood or a specific issue like Flint is family, uh, how is that different than photojournalism? Um, is it possible to show some of the work that I had? Yes, I absolutely. That would be lovely. Yeah. That would be great. Uh, I guess the PowerPoint. Or the video, too. <laughs> Hi, Terrence. This is Grandma. I just wanted to know how is everything working out for you. I hope you're doing well. God bless you. Have a good time and do the right thing. I remember when I was younger, me and my cousin and a friend, we had a few dollars in our pocket, so we went to the flea market. I remember walking in this one vendor's tent. It was an Asian dude, and he was surrounded by a bunch of toys. I s looked around for a minute, and I saw this black BB gun that looked really real. He sold it to me and my cousin for $3 and a jar of BBs for like 2 bucks. Later on that night, we all went outside in the street like running around, screaming, cocking our guns back, and shooting them at each other. My grandmother came out side and saw that, and she started screaming at us with tears in her eyes and taking the guns away from us one by one. I didn't really understand at that time, you know, how serious that was and how quick Somebody could have seen us with those toy guns and thought otherwise. I'm really going to miss this place. It taught me something unexpectedly. And I know a lot of people got a lot of stories from here. You know, this, this uh, um, video reminds me uh, another point that there's now many studies making an association between early life blood exposure and delinquency. So, you know, we think about the impact that lead has on the brain from a cognitive perspective, but it actually now we're finding that may be related with mental disorders such as schizophrenia and delinquency uh, and aggression. So it's not just one effect, it's multiple effects. Mm -hmm. Would you like to make a comment in, in regards to the video? Um, well, the video was like towards the question that you asked yes. about uh, the difference between documenting and photojournalism. 
And I feel like photojournalism is always some type of work that has to return to something. Like, it, photojournalism has more like of a job title. And documenting, I, feels, I feel like the way like Latoya Ruby Frazier did, it's more of trying to document that place and that time to transform whatever is next, like in the future. And I feel like with that video that I made, that was actually a response to the death of Tamir Rice and also that place in my community that they tore down, which was the Carroll City Flea Market. And I feel like, um, I don't know, the need of the document is, I don't know, it's really important. Like, I'm kind of losing my words right now, but yeah. Thank you, thank you. So, Dr. Gardinale, I, I had a question for you, but I'm gonna change it since I'm the moderator. <laughs> so I, I wanna make it a little bit more real for the, for the people that are here, right? So uh, in, in South Florida, uh, there are communities that have been around for many years, uh, pipes that have been laid down many, many years ago. So if you have a concern about the lead levels in your home, what, what would you recommend for an individual to do? I'm, I'm gonna start with something before that, and uh, which is kind of weird. If I were to go and buy a home, <laughs> if I'm, you know, lucky enough that I have the resources to go and purchase a home, I get a whole bunch of papers that says, this home is free of lead, or doesn't have lead paint, or it doesn't have radioactive radon, and you know, a number of things. I'll, I'll do an inspection on the home, and, and so I know where I'm gonna go and live, is that right? If I go across the street and I'm not that fortunate, I don't have money to buy a home, I need to rent a home, I don't get any of that information. I have to prove to the landlord that I'm worth living in that house, but that landlord doesn't have to prove to me that that home is worth living in, mm -hmm. okay? So, uh, I would love to ask the question and say, yeah, I'll fill up this application for, for the rent of the place. How good is my water? Uh, is this place lead free and all that? You know, I know what the answer is gonna be, you know, sadly, but, um, but we do have resources. And um, I, I was searching a little bit about it. You know, you can, um, you can contact the lab and get your water analyzed. You know, that costs you money. Uh, you can go to the Home Depot and then buy one of those kits to, to analyze for lead. That will cost you money. Um, uh, you can get with your community and buy test strips that will tell you whether your water is above that 15 mark. It doesn't get your report, but at least you know what's in there, and that's a lot cheaper. And you can share the price with you know, a whole bunch of people, do a whole bunch of homes. Or, or you can uh, contact somebody that tries to sell you a water filtration system, and if you're smart enough, you end up not buying the system, but you get them to, to test your water. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. so, yeah. See, that's practical advice. Yes. So I, I think we just have to be a little bit more you know, smart the way we do things. So I have no problem calling somebody to try to sell me a filtration system, test my water, you know, and then say, oh, you know, sorry, I don't have the money to buy the, the system. Okay. But, I mean, that's an option. So, so I'm going to... You, you just remind me of something that, you know, is personal to me. So I've been here about three years, and after about a year living here in Miami, uh, we were thinking about buying a home. So my wife was the one that was looking at home, and she found this great house, and, and, you know, it was built in 1969. And actually, lead was not taken out of uh, uh, paint, the policy, until the 70s. So obviously, I have a, a nine-year-old. Sophia, can you stand up? So everybody... That's my daughter, Sophia, right there. And so <laughs> I was very concerned about the fact that this house that my wife loved, uh, uh, you know, would have uh, uh, lead in, in, in the paint. So uh, I asked the, the owner, uh, you know, if he, he was a single owner. So this uh, individual back in the 60s actually paid extra money to buy paint that was started to be sell at the time that had no lead. So we still tested the home and absolutely had no lead. So it was, we were very lucky. But anyway, it's just, it's just interesting. I said, I told my wife, the only way that I would not buy this house, if it has lead, lead paint in it, because even for renovation, it's a huge issue, huge issue. Okay, so let's follow. Um, 
Dr. Patterson. So I understand that your class is studying this topic. And I think some of your students are here. Is that correct? Yes, they are. Very good. So what, what are the lessons learned from uh, the Flint water crisis that uh, increase your understanding of the delivery of public services in and to historically disadvantaged communities and populations? That's a great question. Uh, so I think that, that the first thing that comes to mind is uh, this idea that equity um, trumps equality, right? That in the end, um, sometimes because of, because of, of, of past events, because of uh, past neglect, it may be important to, um, to bring people to, to wholeness. It may be important to give them more than others, as opposed to giving everyone the same. Um, another like a lesson I think is 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 that it's it's important to to uh, to understand that maybe the community does know better than the elected officials who may be in the state capital, um, et cetera, and that um, it really is important to to consider sort of the ethical implications of our actions, right? So this idea that um, uh, for me that, that some things are more important than the bottom line. So here you have this, this, this city that was um, uh, in fiscal distress and a decision was made to save money and the, you know, um, um, President Rosenberg talks about the negative unintended consequences, right? So a decision was made to save money, but this decision that was made had such an adv adverse impact that um, we will never ultimately know what um, the, the, we will never know what the ultimate impact is and the city now, um, the cost, the cost of the decision is much larger, right, than the, the initial fiscal distress. So um, there, you know, there, there, um, there another lesson is that, that, that um, persistent historical systemic inequalities exist, right? They have to be acknowledged and eliminated to improve the health, uh, safety, uh, and welfare of, of not just some residents, not just the wealthy residents, but all residents. So, so um, in my courses, we talk, um, we have these discussions about whether in fact um, government should contract out certain services, right? And, and so, so um, and whether in fact government should deliver certain services or not. And should government operate more like the private sector, right? So that, you know, the efficient and, and productive, et cetera. But the reality is that, again, um, there, there are some things that government has to do that maybe the private sector isn't interested in doing unless, you know, a profit can be attained. And so um, it's the biggest lesson is, is um, the, you know, the public good and the, and the public welfare. Who is looking out for all, for everyone, even, even those who are not wealthy, those who are who have been historically disadvantaged? Who can they rely on to ensure that their needs are met? So I'm going to follow that up because I've had the experiences in New York City when I was at Columbia University, getting receiving phone calls from uh, uh, residents of uh, housing, uh, where the government knew that they have issues, not just lead, but also mold and, and other things. And I'm going to follow you, Dr. Beck Saget, with that question. And even though the agencies that are supposed to correct the problem were not responding, or they were responding a year or a year and a half or two years later, 
uh, re despite the fact that the residents have repeated phone calls and requests to come. So, so the question is, who is going to take care of the problem if the agency that is supposed to do that and correct it are not doing it? Yeah, and, and so again, um, that leads me to the, 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 the question of, of, you know, it's always the, the question of resources. Right. That's Absolutely. So, so, you know, that the needs increase, the, the, the resources continue to to shrink. But um, I would argue that and, and what and what we discuss in my in my in my class classes are the sort of the the importance of integrity. In the delivery of of public services. Right. So so the. For me, it's how how do you um, engage and educate the next generation of public servants in a way that they understand that you know there there are some problems that cannot be ignored, and that 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 that, that it, they must do what is ethical and what is right and in these situations. So. Thank you. So Dr. Bexaga, you, um, your work, you, you work in these in this communities here in, in, in Miami and, 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 and South uh, Florida. I, I wonder whether you can tell us some of your experiences of these neighborhoods that you go and, 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 and do your work, whether it's with lead or other uh, horrific situations that you have encountered in, in poor communities. I'd love to talk about our study, Great Indoors. Um, but first, I just want to tell you, I have been working at, in public health um, and getting paid by the public um, since 1981. Um, and at the, uh, this is at the city level, county level, state level, um, and of course the national level at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And now I'm an academic, which is very disinhibiting. If you know what I mean, it's very disinhibiting. It has loosened my tongue. <laughs> so um, even though I guess we're state employees, so I, I, I'm not going to talk about like global warming or anything. But, <laughs> but let me tell you about sometimes I actually feel that the evil landlords, uh, the diabolical landlords, were easier for us to manage than when it's our own people, when it's HUD, when it's public housing. It, that is very painful to, to see. This is, this is friendly fire. This is our side. Mm -hmm. um, and what we're doing with Great Indoors, and this is the disinhibited part, is that um, our students uh, in maternal and child health are being trained to, as part of their training in research and community-based research, to go to homes um, as part of this, this training to see what the impact um, of integrated pest management, which is to control um, cockroaches, and it's, it's interesting, we, we work in a community in Liberty City where there is a lot of crime. In just this six month um, study period, there have been two shootings, um, one of them fatal of uh, the father of one of our participants and non-fatal uh, of one of our participants and her child, the mother. We deal just with mothers. And it's always in people's minds how horrible the violence is and the idea that you could die uh, at any time. But right under there is the conditions of the housing. Right after dying um, in, in a violent uh, way. And the things that they most hated was the cockroaches. And then in third place, the mold. But when we told them, you know, in exchange for participating in this, you can get your water and your paint tested for lead. It's like, come on in. <laughs> they really are so scared because they don't have, they have nothing. And they think of their children as um, they could, they have all the same hopes 
that Dr. Guilarte had for Sofia and that I had for Santiago and Cachita. Uh, they are, you know, they are our future. And they feel exactly the same way. And some little thing like, um, like what we are, have been talking about could derail that and end them up in special education or worse. Um, so we've had in Great Indoors a great experience because it's just about responding to the problems uh, in the homes. And we've seen um, even things like that we don't normally consider public health, like getting people who are clinically depressed to recognize, I have a treatable condition <laughs> and get treated. And your home has a treatable condition. This, you don't have to live with surrounded by cockroaches. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, those are, are very, um, very spirited things. But part of this is the angry mob. <laughs> because it turns out that neither the landlords nor the government agencies respond to um, rational complaints. They respond to the angry mob, and the angry mob. And this is something that I'm, I'm kind of always recruiting. Your voices, as people that are not part of that community, can, can be tremendously helpful if you are people that are they're more likely to hear. You see what I'm saying? Those people are not isolated. Those are our neighbors. Those are our children, and. The, <clears throat> Part of you have to be part of the angry mob. Yeah. <laughs> because so, so I, I, those are, that, that's a great comment, and I'm going to follow up with a global question. Right? Seems to me, and I, and I've said many times that we as a society are as good as our lowest denominator. If we don't raise the, the lowest denominator, we're not doing what we're supposed to do as a society. So the question that I have is, why are we failing? as a society, in my opinion, in many of these issues. And because right now, the disparity in the economy is even greater than it used to be 15, 20 years ago. Yes. So what do we need to change? The mob mentality may be one thing. We may have to go back to the you know, 60s and 70s and, and, and be out in the street and, and... But also, I mean, she made, Dr. Patterson made a very important point. It is a big mistake. This is Pediatrics 101 it, and Public Health 101. It's a big mistake to say that what a mother has observed and is concerned about with their kids is, is in, in her head. or something. A lot of lawsuits have started, like malpractice suits start that way. And also a lot of foolish deeds. And when you talk about this... Um, this wording, cost-effective, almost all cost-effective things are penny-wise and pound-foolish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you invest in children's nutrition, in children's environments, and in children's... Um, education. That's the word. Mm -hmm. Yes, education, and in a, in, a, in a very broad way, not just going to take a, a test, but also in art, in... Um, physical education, those are the things that really are cost effective. They are very, and this is not just with lead and mold and insects, it's also with HIV. I had the same fights that I'm having here. I fought in the Dominican Republic to get past, get people past the idea that poor people do better with the cheapest possible option. It's like, no, you're going to pay big time. You can save money by preventing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just, that's, that's the real, I, I hate that term, cost effectiveness and also uh, appropriate technology. Hello. <laughs> that's. Thank you. So, so I want to thank the panelists, but I want to open now. <clears throat> the, the discussion for question from the audience to any other panelists. One here, right here, the first. I want to know two things. First, what is the incidence of uh, th this problem of lead intoxication in the United States? And what is the average cost 
for treating a patient and who pays for that, okay. particularly in those communities. You want to you tackle that or you want me to yes. take the first? Um, actually, uh, you can do your part and I'm just going to make a quick comment. Yeah. So, so there's no question that public health policy of removing the lead from gasoline and paint has been effective in reducing the average blood lead in the population in the United States uh, from today, looking back to the, you know, the 60s, 70s, 50s, no question, it's been a dramatic decrease. The problem is that the lead is so ubiquitous in our environment that I was looking at the latest statistics that uh, the CDC puts out for 2014. They lag a few years. Uh, you still, we're still seeing a, a significant number of children throughout the United States with bloodlets in the 50s and 60s. Now, the standard had gone down to five, so that raised a number of children that has now considered to be at a level that is of concern to their, to their health. So the incident, in my opinion, is still too high. Now, that's in the United States. Now, think in places uh, in other parts of the world, we're still using lead gasoline where, uh, you know, the, there's no regulations like the types of regulation that we have here in the United States. It's many, 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 many multiple number of children that are being exposed on a daily basis. So, so you asked about the cost. Um, as, as Dr. Guilarte said, even while the levels keep going down, as, the, as we learn and understand more about lead than the population that is affected, um, the size of the population that is affected is, is huge. So the short answer is uh, who treats them? How do they get treated? The answer is no one and in no way. And who pays for it? Um, we don't pay anything in the short term because we're thinking about things like they don't need school lunches. It doesn't help them do better in school. Um, we, we don't need any kind of enrichment. We should, we should let them, uh, you know, fish or cut bait. But we, we, we do pay for it. We do pay for it because decades after, and sometimes just a few years after, those neglected children become the underclass, part of an underclass of very difficult to integrate marginalized people. And those are very expensive people, especially in our society when our main, it's changing, thank God, our main uh, response to that is to incarcerate uh, people who have uh, learning disabilities because there is a huge connection between that and those kind of learning and those kinds of uh, uh, delinquent behaviors. Mm -hmm. That is a very expensive proposition, um, but it's cost effective. Yes, the calcium EDTA is something that we reserve, um, even now, we reserve for like double digit levels of um, intoxication. And those are in the public sector. You can, you can treat uh, children in that way, from, but we rarely have to do that because most of the levels have fallen. Yeah, there's another treatment that's called succimer that with DDTA you have to inject it and it was very painful. The, the child had to be um, hospitalized for a couple of weeks. Oh no, for the not treatment. for calcium EDTA. But, but, but the succimer is oral. And now, so you can, you know, they, they don't have to uh, do uh, hospitalizations and, and things like that. Okay, we have another question. question. Mm -hmm. oh. When I sold my oh. house in Minnesota, in so, Minnesota, so.
So, d d you know, there are estimates of cost uh, from, from lead, lead intoxication in children that, you know, it, it, it can, it, in the billions of dollars. So it, it's definitely, um, from many of the issues that Dr. Beck Saget mentioned, uh, these children are not going to be oftentimes incorporated into society in a positive way. And so it's, it's, it's a very costly proposition. Hi, my name is Corey. I'm from Michigan. Um, so first, I have a question for everyone, and then I have a question for the panel. Uh, so how many people still think that the Flint water crisis is going on by a show of hands right now? That the Flint water crisis is still going on, right? Exactly. So we, we, still, we have awareness in this room. Maybe there's not awareness around everywhere else that it's over, it's, it's done. But Michigan actually is leads with repealing the most funding for water treatment and water things like that so legislation is not responding to that awareness if we have a water issue so my question for you all is what do we need to do to get people involved to help support that legislation to happen to provide opportunities funding as well as you know those types of laws that can protect those communities what can be done to support participation what's the best way to get people involved so legislation is moving forward and michigan actually is the only state in the united states that's going backwards on water protection legislation and every other state and Florida is actually one of the best when it comes to supporting those types of things. So how do we get people involved and how do we keep legislation supporting that? I, I, <clears throat> I, I'm going to start it. I think you, the, the, um, that you elect people who will be making those decisions in the legislature to ensure that that happens. And, and um, I was reading an article um, I think last night that, that there's a new governor and, and the new governor is starting to um, sign executive orders and, and trying to move some things forward, right? So more of that. Um, to, to the risk of being expelled from this place, I'm gonna take two different approaches. And there are two things that we normally don't talk to. One is politics and the other one is religions, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, I, I was talking to one of the people that was the leading scientist trying to ban um, components on sunscreen to, to coral reef and all that. You know, that's, that's the new kid in the blog, is that right? And he said, we've been doing this so wrong for so long, trying to convince the politicians and the elected officials and all that. All I did was went to church. So, what? Yeah, if each one of us that has some kind of awareness of these problems, go, go to whatever church we choose to go. And it becomes a conversation in the church. Mm -hmm. And the pastor, the priest, you know, whoever is dealing the things brings it into the conversation every week. I and mean, you have a multiplying factor that we don't have any other way of doing it. You know, and then I say, well, you know, this, this is kind of foolish, you know, how am I listening <laughs> to this thing? And, and then it kicked in, is that right? I mean, most of us go to church, you know, and, you know, if you engage the pastor or whoever is there to, to in the sermon, talk about this, you know, it might be an odd topic, you know, for the congregation, but we all listen to it, you know. It will be like multiplying one of these events, you know, in every church, in, in every community. So it wasn't that foolish, you know. I'm not, I'm not advocating to, to do that, you know, for everything, but there are some issues that affect our communities that they need to go to where we have conversations. You know, uh, politicians are much more difficult to, to, to deal with. So it's an option, you know. Question here? Um, I just needed to, uh, it, that's a very great point of what you were explaining, but I know Reverend uh, Pigney, mm -hmm. who uh, was part of the, he was an activist for what's, what was happening in Flint, and he said before it happened that the water was going to, be a source of, you know, issues. And uh, Reverend Pigney, uh, an elder with his wife, uh, he, what he did is that he went um, against the politicians uh, that, uh, that were with the, the establishment and General Electric, and they incarcerated him. Okay? So, the only, I have a movement called Save It mm. that has to do with trying to save this city, because I live here, right, from the globalists, from what they're doing. Because you know why? Nobody goes along aside my movement, because there's a lot of people that are selling out to 
prove the establishment. We're selling out to the globalists, exactly. We're selling out. We are, we're having a situation with little Haiti, who's the, which now is the most gentrified you know, community, with Dragon Global coming in there, okay, and taking little Haiti, incorporating Liberty City. We're having all these shootings, but people, if we do not, the scholars, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to speak to the scholars first because they have this high status, you know, with all due respect, they have this high status mentality where, you know, and they lie. They come to, not, not you guys, you guys have been like a blessing. They lie, they come to the panel, they lie, they hide, and, you know. We need to have that 60s movement spirit <laughs> where we go out into the street and we, and we go into city hall, right in front of city hall, and if you have time, go to City Hall and, like, I'm having time right now, go to City Hall and get into your agenda. You're going to see how corrupt our uh, polit politicians are. I didn't know that Miami, because see, when I was a substitute teacher, they came to the classroom, the, the Miami-Dade sewage department, and said that we had the best water. But I didn't believe that, and I personally went up to the gentleman that was telling me, our children, that we had the best water, and it was all lies. You being a chemist, uh, isn't it very great if we would have a pH balanced body, alkaline pH, pH balanced body? Because that's the only way that diseases would come out, you know? And you spoke about chelation. The, the three, the chelation therapy, yeah. Right. That's, yeah, that's great. I think, yeah, we will. Um, it's a good, good comment. Okay. Um, yeah, I was going to say that um, I think somebody, I forgot who on the panel mentioned, that it was a year and a half that they had notified about the water and nothing was done to switch it back to the clean source. So I think the people did speak up, but nobody was listening to them. I was wondering, as I was sitting here, water is such an essential part to life. After 9-11, we created uh, Homeland Security. Since this is happening and there's so many variables in different communities, why haven't we worked together to create a federal agency that would, everybody would have to adhere so there wouldn't be a variable? In other words, one agency and then sort of like Homeland Security was created after 9-11. Why hasn't there Well, that, that's what EPA is supposed to do, right? <laughs> and I think you know what's happened with EPA, so I, I will leave that one there. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say EPA. Yes. Can I make a quick comment about, um, about EPA? You see how disinhibited I am? Uh, I would never have done this when I was at CDC. There was one of my uh, colleagues from CDC um, went to lead, she also was a pediatrician, went to lead um, in EPA, the children's health part, and she was really very enthusiastic about trying to address threats to child health in the environment. And she was seeing a lot of motion, and she was thinking, we're going to really, we're going to get these poisons out. But she was the one that got, was out. <laughs> she was the only one that was actually gotten out was uh, Dr. Berkelman. And this, I'm not telling you something that's a mystery. This was in the news. It was in the New York Times. She was out. And there was no explanation, um, neither public nor private, for this. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, having a government agency, especially nowadays, that is tasked with something, that doesn't necessarily mean that they have um, 
the liberty to do any of the things that they were intended to do or that they were created to do. We're in different times. We're just in different times. Great, we have a question back here. Thank you all, this has been uh, so wonderful and I wanna thank uh, Mariana Ramirez for organizing uh, Latoya Ruby Frazier of Flint's family. It's uh, such a wonderful exhibition, and I have to also say that Terrence's photographs are incredible and visceral and raw, and if you haven't seen his show, Dancing with Pain, at the Art Center um, on Lincoln Road, I really encourage you to go see it. It's, I feel like it's required viewing um, for all of us. And Terrence, I wanted to ask you, um, if you've thought about you know, the next five years, the next 10 years, um, do you see yourself following uh, perhaps the type of path that Latoya Ruby Frazier um, sort of carved where she first focused on her own community of Braddock, Pennsylvania, um, and then later documented Flint? Um, or do you see yourself you know, continuing to document Miami Gardens and Miami, or are there other communities that you're drawn to? Uh, also, thank you for checking out the show and mentioning it to everybody. But um, yeah, I do. I see myself still documenting a lot of neighborhoods in Miami because although like my focus on my photography isn't too much on water and Latoya Ruby Frazier, you know, documented the Flint water crisis. Um, in Miami, what I'm battling against is like the displacement of people and also the communities here in Miami. A lot of communities are disappearing. We have Little Haiti, which is like this lady mentioned, which is, you know, being gentrified like every single day. Like, since I grew up in Miami all my life, I've never seen so many condos being built on like every single corner. And um, in the video that I just showed, that was a place in my neighborhood that got taken down, which was filled with like, you know, black owned businesses. And that's gone now. And now what's there is like a Burlington Coat Factory and other stores and stuff. When that place could have been like the source for culture to keep moving forward. And me documenting these communities, I'm basically, you know, I'm, I'm showing people that, you know, we're here. And like in an interview that I just did, I mentioned that with these pictures, you can't say that these people did not exist. So I do see myself five years, 10 years down the line still documenting neighborhoods here in Miami. And I do hope to travel to other communities, of course, but I feel like the mission starts here and I can't let us just fade away. Yeah. Great, thank you. All right, maybe one more question or, all right. Thanks, so we talk about this as, as the 2014 Flint water crisis and, and I'm from Michigan, so I spent my formative years there and sort of watched this whole thing unfold. But to me, this sort of, looks like the midpoint of the thing, not okay. not the beginning of the thing. As in sort of looking at the position, like now it's sort of to ask the question, the one I want to ask you is who's ultimately responsible? It's sort of easy to point the finger at the, the manager and say, oh, he was just trying to save a buck, so he switched the water source and created the lead problem. But to me, this sort of goes back a lot further. I mean, like how did Flint end up with a manager rather than an actual elected democratic government? Instead, we sort of look at the financial crisis in 2008 and then the auto industry and the failed bailout and the fact that it never ultimately came back to this. I'd sort of like to ask all of you, like, where do we actually start with this? And who ultimately is responsible for the creation of and then ultimately paying for this crisis that was a manufacturing crisis? This isn't a thing that had to happen. It's a thing that did happen as a result of lots and lots of decisions over decades like yeah we could have managers in michigan before this but it didn't really happen until the financial crisis so like what do you all think but like like where did this crisis actually start thanks okay and i just take a stab at that so I, I i agree with you i think this goes back to the early 1900s industry for many many years knew that lead was a problem that that lead was toxic and they hide it they hide the data there's a recent book by a colleague at columbia university that describe the first factor of tetraethyl lead in, in New Jersey. And it's really interesting because when I read the book, it described for the first time after 60 years or more 
the fact that there is a connection that we made now in our animal studies between early life lead exposure and schizophrenia. The, the workers that first started in this book and described the work, and actually the data came out because of litigation uh, uh, against the, the lead industry where a lot of this information finally came out where they had workers in this very first tetraethyl lead factory in New Jersey being carried out, having psychotic episodes uh, to hospitals in New York City. So industry for many, many, many decades hid the toxicity of lead and the problem that lead in paint was going to cause to society, to humans. So I agree with you. I don't think this is a you know, a, a, an issue that is now is an issue that's been with us for many, many years and has been hidden. The people that knew the issues that we we're going to face did not tell us. Uh, I just want to make the comment listening to all these is that the, the, the Flint case really just highlights the need have to have the conversation again and either in uh, informing the communities that are 3,000 uh, communities with uh, above the uh, the lead poisoning levels so they need to educate them and maybe there is a place for a class action suit that will actually generate the funding to help the children and so that's a project has to be taken up by a legal team or legal institute and then Dr. Gardinelli got me thinking about there's a business model there. We need to provide lab testing for individual households and develop a lab testing. Now, we, we have people come and test your pool, right? They come and test the quality of the pool water. So we need to have a cheaper and much more uh, accessible uh, uh, system to test lab and maybe FIU will lead in that process. Mm -hmm. Why not? <laughs> All right. I think I would like to invite everyone. We will have a reception on the terrace, and our panelists will be joining us if you have more burning questions. And also, the exhibition is open on the second floor. Latoya Ruby Frazier, Flint is family. Thank you all so much Thank for you. joining us. Thank you, guys.